Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we have, I'd like to welcome Renee Eaton from BizExcel. She's going to be presenting the webinar today. We're going to save the questions till the end. So um, at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll uh, ask if anybody has any questions. So go ahead, Renee, you can get started. And uh, thanks for, for doing the presentation today. Great. Thanks, Christine. Uh, thanks for having me here. And uh, welcome to everyone to Building Cultures That Don't Just Survive, They Rock. We're going to be talking today about going beyond just having a resilient culture to building a thriving one. Um, as Christine said, my name is Renee. I'm a consultant at PhysXL. I've been working with companies for the last 10 years here, helping clients build strong cultures, leaders, and teams. When putting this presentation together, I realized that my headshot was majorly out of date. Um, so instead of that picture, you get a picture of me with one of my coworkers' new puppies instead. I figured that would be a nice way of starting off our, our presentation here. Um, some of you may have seen us at the Inspiring Women's event with our Build a Kick-Ass Company program. Building healthy cultures is something that we take very seriously when working with clients. And one thing we hear a lot about lately in regards to culture is resilience. Um, many companies stress the importance of having people who are resilient, and they put a focus on building these resiliency skills, which isn't a surprise with the pace of business these days and the continual need to be lean and do more of less. Um, before we get into talking about that, what I'd like to do is start off with a little exercise. So on your screen right now, you should see three tens. Now what I want you to do is you can jot these down on a little piece of paper in front of you. What I want you to do is try to make them into 950 using just one straight line. So I'm going to wait here a couple seconds. Now this is an exercise we do a lot of our groups. We like to introduce it as a way to get people kind of adjusting their thinking and thinking outside the box a bit. And my guess is that by now you haven't figured it out because not many people do when we introduce this. So some of you may have been trying to turn the three tens right into nine five zero using a line. Some of you may have been trying to do some type of math equation to make the number 950. If you have an IT background, you might be thinking binary code, so the ones and the zeros. And I've even had some people talk about Roman numerals when it comes to this. So if I told you time, would that help you? And my guess is still going to be that you're still struggling with this. So now you can see on the screen 10 to 10. So 10 to 10 is 950 in time. So we like to introduce activities like this because when it comes to business, if we have the same way of thinking, we end up with the same results that we've had before. And sometimes we get stuck in a box and we need to get some new information and a new perspective in order to get different results. And that's what we believe is necessary when it comes to the focus on building resilient organizations. We start to ask if it's just trying to use a Band-Aid to cover up a larger issue. While resiliency is no doubt a valuable quality in employees and in organizations, should it be our end game? We shouldn't want employees to have to use their resiliency skills. Have them in case of a crisis, yes, but need them on a regular basis, no. Resilience isn't really this never-ending spring that employees can keep going to to protect themselves. It's something that employees will eventually run out of if they have to continually drink from it. So even the most optimistic, positive employees will eventually become drained and stressed and discouraged, which leads to disengagement within our organization, which definitely is something that we don't want to have going in there. So we believe the goal should be to go beyond companies that are merely resilient with employees who can continually pick themselves off the ground and instead strive for companies that thrive. So today we're going to look at three different ways to create these cultures that we say rock. So the ways we're going to look at here is we're going to talk about starting with one, building strong support systems, and finding our purpose within our organizations. So let's look at that first step and uh, starting with one. If you've ever flown on a plane before, you've probably heard the flight attendants go through their safety precautions before the flight takes off. So they tell you how to properly buckle your belt, where the exits are on the plane, one area that I find particularly interesting when it comes to organizations is when they describe the oxygen mask. So what to do in the case of an emergency if the mask comes down. So when the mask comes down, the attendants always tell you secure your own mask first and then help others. And the message to this is, is you can't help anyone else until you take care of yourself first. 
So when we look at organizations and we look at teams, a company is really just a group of people working together. So if we want to have a great company, you've got to have great people. And that means people who feel good about themselves, they're happy, they're confident and competent, and they're passionate about their work. So we must focus on building awesome people first, and the awesome teams and organizations will come as a result of these. A lot of time in the work that we do, we'll go into organizations, and on first glance, it will look something like this picture here, all these smiling faces coming to greet us. But the more we go in and we talk to people in the organization, we start to get a slightly different look. And it looks a bit more like this. So you have some people who are happy, we have a few that are okay, and then every now and then there's a bomb sitting near the back. And I bet many of you can think of at least one person you've worked with in your careers who's been a bomb. And you know what it's like to have a person like that on a team and it just doesn't feel good. You can be having a great discussion and then all of a sudden one person walks into the room and the mood completely changes. You can't be as open, you can't be as vulnerable, you can't take as many risks. And you have to start kind of like tiptoeing around and guarding your words. And it's a dangerous thing to have people like this in our organizations because it spreads. It's something that we can all catch. We're very empathetic creatures, humans, and we feel what other people are feeling. We sense emotions and we mirror them. That's why we're more likely to cry when we watch a sad movie. Uh, when somebody is angry, we're more likely to be angry. When somebody is frustrated, we're more likely to be frustrated. And on the flip side, when someone is happy, we're more likely to be happy too. These are called mirror, excuse me, mirror neurons. So we can't have a thriving organizational culture unless each person in it feels good about themselves and has the right attitude. I always like to think of a story I heard um, a while back about a carpenter who was ready to retire. He'd had a really long, successful career, and then he wanted to spend more time with his family and do some more fishing. So he told his boss um, that he was going to be done. And the boss was sad to see him go because he'd always been an exceptional worker and they'd become really good friends. But he understood that it was time for him to retire and spend some more time on himself and being with his family. But he asked him to do one last favor. He said, can you do this work on this final house? The carpenter agreed, even though his heart really wasn't in it, he'd rather not do it. The boss took him out to where the house was. It was a beautiful lot on a lake. And the carpenter said, okay, I'll do this for you. So we got to work. Um, but he just wasn't feeling it. He cut corners, he used inferior material, and he rushed the work because he just wanted to get it done. And every day he ate his lunch looking out over this lake and thinking of how when he was done, he could spend his time at a place like that fishing. So he finally finished the job, the boss came out to inspect the work, he looked around, he shook the carpenter's hand, and then he handed him the keys to the house. And he says, this is my gift to you for all the hard work you've done over the years, you've been a really great friend. What we have to remember of our organizations is that each person in it is a builder. Each person impacts how the organization will look. And these choices impact those around them as well. Winston Churchill said, attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. So the first step when it comes to creating great organizational cultures is working with people on an individual level to ensure that they have the right attitude towards their work. Because when we look at the people that we want to work with within our organizations, Who's the type of people that we want to work with? We want to work with people who are open, generous, and connected. And when we ask ourselves this question every day, we have to ask the second question of, is this us? If we want to work with people like that, we need to work on being people like that too. And each one of us within an organization is responsible for our own attitude and how it affects the people around us. So the first thing we need to do is choose what type of people we are going to be. Are we going to be awesome people that contribute to the team or are we not going to be awesome people that contribute to the organization? Because within our organizations, we need to ensure that each person takes responsibility for their attitude. We have to make sure that they take responsibility for the influence they have on others and that they take responsibility and ownership of their choices, their behaviors, and their actions. And this is a personal choice that each person makes. No one can force someone to have this right attitude, but we can influence them through the culture and through the environment to make different choices in what they're doing. One of uh, a great activity that we often use um, when we bring this exercise in and we talk about building strong individuals is an exercise called strength sharing. And this is something that you can do yourself um, and you can do it within your teams as well. And you'll see on the screen here there are three different questions. What do I like about myself? What are my strengths? 
and what accomplishments I'm really proud of. And so what you do is you sit down, each person, and they take a couple minutes and they talk and they write down what they like about themselves, what they feel their strengths are, and what accomplishments I'm really proud of. And what we find in organizations is a lot of time we have a tendency um, to focus towards the negative aspects. So we'll talk a lot about where we need to improve ourselves, where our weaknesses may be in order to become stronger people. The problem when we focus on these negative aspects is that's where our focus is now in all the time. Um, and it's the same thing when we talk about failures and we focus on failures more as the brain actually becomes remapped to consistently look that way and consistently feel that way. And that definitely impacts our attitudes about how we go into work and how we work with other people. So when we introduce an exercise like this, where we start focusing on our strengths and the good things we've done and the accomplishments we have, we actually start rewiring the brain to focus on the positive aspects and to have that type of attitude as we go through. And we build up that strong um, attitude that we need to not just be focusing on the resiliency side of things. And you'd be surprised when we bring this into organizations how hard it is for groups and people to actually do this. I had uh, one gentleman the other day in an organization we were working with who couldn't think of one thing he liked about himself. And so that's something that we really need to be cognizant of when we're working with people is where do we see our strengths? What do we like about ourselves? What do we feel that we've accomplished? Because in answering those questions, we can see where we are awesome and where we contribute and where we feel good about ourselves. So not only does this allow people to focus on the good things about themselves, building their confidence, but it also allows people within teams to connect on a more personal level. It allows us to build trust and more open communication because we feel good talking to one another about these things and people will learn about how people see themselves. So what I think is somebody's strengths, it might not be something that they see themselves in the same manner of light. So it starts opening up communication and it starts get, to get people connecting and it starts building trust within the teams. And we really need to look at trust when it comes to building a thriving culture. When we think of resiliency and perseverance, we usually think of them as individual traits, so something people innately have or they work to cultivate. But there's this dirty little secret about perseverance, is the fact that it often has nothing to do with the individual, and it has everything to do with those around them. So strong perseverance is frequently the result of the support of people who care about you or believe in you and believe in what you're doing. And these solid relationships help build people back up when you failed. They encourage you to keep going when you're worn out. They allow you to bounce ideas off of others when you're roadblocked and celebrate your accomplishments when you succeed. Families, communities, and businesses all work the same way. The ones that don't just survive but thrive are the ones that have put the time and energy into building sustaining relationships and emotional connections. And that's really the step two to building a thriving culture is building a really strong support system within your organization that people can use to keep them going when times make it rough or they need that extra help. Now there's a simple equation that we look at when we're talking about building what we like to call kick-ass culture, so these really strong cultures. And that's to promote high levels of engagement, you must have employees who have a will to win, who are committed to the company, have passion for what they're doing, and are really willing to go the extra mile. However, this will to win is in a direct connection with the employee's fear of failure. So this is employees who are afraid to take chances or give their advice or opinion, if they feel uncertain or insecure in their roles, if they don't trust what they're told from their leaders or they aren't giving good idea reasons to do the things, um, then their will to win will be reduced and the culture ends up suffering. So when employees are forced to worry about threats within the organization, the organization becomes less able to deal um, with those threats outside of it. So uncertainty and insecurity can rob people of their ability to build those strong relationships and the trust necessary to do the great work that matters. So it really breaks down to simply trust over fear. Those are the two aspects that we're working with when we go in and we're building thriving cultures is we need to make sure that trust is always outweighing fear. When people feel safe, then they're more willing to take risks. 
when people feel safe, they're more willing to voice their opinions on things. When people feel safe about their jobs, they're more willing to help somebody else in their own work. So we always need to make sure that we have these strong levels of trust so that people willingly go out of their way to do more and that fear ends up getting reduced so people don't have to worry about their own safety within the organization. And, and these can be tricky topics to talk about because things like trust and cooperations, they're not things that we can tell people, their feelings. So everybody knows that when somebody comes up to them and they say, trust me, it'll be all right, you start to get that feeling inside that maybe you shouldn't trust this person. Trust and feelings come, trust comes through our actions and that's how people start to feel that they can actually trust somebody because they've exhibited it in some way to them. Uh, it's not something that we can tell people to do, so it's all those little actions and behaviors built up over time. I like to equate it to when we talk about handshakes, um, and people will say, oh, I didn't trust that guy, he didn't shake my hand. Well, the handshake um, is a really great example of a behavior that exhibits trust, because handshakes were originally used, is that when you shook an adversary's hand, you left your wrist bare, and you gave that person the ability to actually chop your hand off in medieval times and it's always your dominant hand that you shake hands with so that's your sword hand. So the fact that you're actually putting your hand out shows that you trust that that person's not going to do it. Uh, a great definition I heard about trust a while ago was trust is giving somebody the ability to hurt you knowing that they won't. Um, if you've ever seen a full arm handshake, it's when you actually grasp the person's forearm. Uh, and they did this back in the day to show people that there was no weapons hidden up their sleeves. So it's the little behaviors and actions that we take that show trust and that give us those feelings that, okay, this is a good place, this is somewhere where I can feel safe. And when I like to think about strong organizations, I like to think of it as a brick wall when we're building support systems. So if you look at a brick wall and ask, why is this wall strong? And oftentimes we'll say, well, it's a brick wall, it's because of the bricks. That's what keeps it strong. However, what really keeps a brick wall strong is the mortar between the bricks, the mortar that holds them together. That's what gives it its strength. So the mortar keeps the bricks from rubbing away at one another, causing too much friction, and the mortar gives it stability. Walls will fall down well before the bricks degrade because the mortar was not applied properly. It has nothing to do with the bricks themselves. So when we look at our organization, the bricks are the people and the mortar is something that we like to call social capital. That's what builds the support system and that's what keeps it strong on that level. Um, there's often that saying that two brains are better than one. We know this is not true. You can have two extremely intelligent people in the same room working on a problem and they can be clashing the whole time. They can be disgruntled with one another. They can think the other person doesn't respect them. They can't they can believe that they don't trust that other person, and it can be a really terrible situation. Um, if you can't get them to work together, it doesn't matter how many intelligent people you have in the room, how many skilled people you have in the room, it's just no good. Where we get our real value in teams is when people are willing to come together and help one another. So you can stack a bunch of bricks on top of one another, that doesn't make it a wall. So how do we add the mortar properly? How do we get that social capital that really gives us strengths within our teams? So when we talk about social capital, this is trust. This is people who are willing to exchange knowledge with one another. This is people who share values that create a quality of life and make that group strong and successful. Social capital is really our reliance and our interdependency that builds trust. So social capital is what gives companies momentum. It's what makes companies robust in the end. And this social capital is what prompts us to want to share ideas with one another. It's what prompts us to want to share our concerns, to contribute to one another's way of thinking and to add on to it, and really warn others if they see potential risks early. Um, we had, uh, I worked with an organization not long ago and one of their leaders was telling us about a past company he had worked with and it was common practice within that organization that at the end of the year or the quarter, 10% of the leaders would be cut. That was just how it worked. So the 10% of the lowest producers of the leaders were going to be, they were going to be fired from their job. 
So when you think of this type of environment and how much social capital is going to be there, and you're going to have probably very little because we've created an environment where there's a high level of fear and there's not a lot of trust going on because if I'm in an environment where I know that I have the potential, if I'm down at the bottom to lose my job, am I going to want to help somebody else and possibly make them look better than me? No, I'm probably not going to go out of my way to do that. Am I going to want to ask somebody else for help when I'm struggling with something? I'm probably not going to want to do that either because I don't want to be seen as weak or not very good at my job. Am I going to want to warn somebody if I see that there might be something happening with their project that could have a detrimental effect on it? Probably not because if I do that, then they may end up doing well at what they're doing and I may end up down in the 10% of the bottom and I may end up losing my job. So it becomes very hard to create social capital and keep that wall strong when we have to worry about these things within our organization. When we go in and we talk with teams and we talk with companies, we like to talk about what the very definition of a team is. So right now, I want you to think of what the definition of a team is. I'm sure you all have one in your head. We talk about teams all the time at work. Teamwork is you know, our um, rallying cry when we come into organizations. So I'm betting that the definition that you're thinking of right now looks something like this. A group of people working together towards a common goal. Usually this is one of those mind reading things. We'll have somebody right at the front that says exactly that. And it makes complete sense. So when we think about the definition of a team, we think of people who have a goal in mind that they're working towards all together. They're dependent on one another to get there. They have some rules as to how they're going to go about doing this, and in the end, they produce results. So this is the team that we have. And this is fine. This is what a team does. But when we think about teams in the manner of building social capital, what we want to do is put a different spin on it. Um, and it can make a really big difference when working within our teams. So our new definition of a team is a group of people who go out of their way to make one another look good. So it's a completely different attitude shift when we're going there. So if our goal as a team is to make one another look good, then that's going to completely change the way that I go about doing my work. Um, Lance, uh, not Lance Armstrong, um, Chris Hadfield, um, everybody's heard of Chris Hadfield, the Canadian astronaut. He's given us some great videos of what you can do in space. He ran one of the most successful teams on the International Space Station. Um, they had the least amount of conflicts as they did their work. And he had uh, people from Russia and other nations on there, and they were all working together. And one of the things that he attested to the strength of his teams and the little conflict that they had with them was he made sure that everybody was going out of their way to make one another look good. He had a rule that was an unwritten rule that everybody had to follow it on the International Space Station. And that rule was that every single day, every astronaut had to do one kind of thing for every other astronaut every single day. That was an unwritten rule. So you needed to look all of the time for chances to do something nice for somebody else. So that was your goal every day is going around saying, okay, well, it's not my job to check the equipment here, but I'll do it. It's not my job to do meal prep, but I'll do it. So they were constantly building social capital. They were constantly building good feelings between one another. They were constantly helping one another and going out of their way to make one another look good. So you can see the perspective, the shift in our perspective that that takes when we look at it this way. Um, great teams with high social capital are committed to one another. A team of MIT researchers analyzed groups that proved exceptionally effective at creative problem solving. Um, and what their goal was, was to identify what made some teams so much better at this than others. And what they found was it wasn't individual intelligence, so the bricks themselves, when we talk about the wall. Individual intelligence didn't make a big difference. And having a high group intelligence so a, a group with a strong IQ or one or two superstars wasn't critical either. The groups that they found were better and had more problem-solving abilities shared really just two key qualities. First, they gave one another equal talk time. 
So this wasn't something that they monitored or they regulated, but no one in these high achieving groups dominated the conversation and no one was just merely a passenger. Everyone contributed to the group and nothing one person said was wasted. And they made sure that if they saw somebody who wasn't contributing, to draw that person out and ask for their opinion. And the second quality was something they called social sensitivity. And these groups had individuals that were tuned into one another. So they could sense subtle shifts in the mood or the demeanor of the group. And they could change the way they reacted based upon that. So if somebody came in and was frustrated, they could sense that and kind of draw it out and see what was going on. And they actually measure this um, on a really cool test called Reading the Mind in the Eyes. And you can look it up online, just Google Reading um, the Mind in the Eyes. And what it is is you get this test and it has a series of photographs of just people's eyes. And what you do is you try to guess or discern what emotion that person is feeling just by looking at their eyes. And what this test is, is it's broadly considered a test for empathy. So these groups that were really great at problem solving, they were socially alert to one another's needs. So they were trying to make sure that they understood where that person was coming from. And that really added to making sure that they could go out of the way to make one another look good. So how do we build more social capital into our company so that our companies are filled with people who go out of the way to make one another look good? So I'm gonna go through just some tips that you can start um, incorporating into your own culture to make sure that it's really thriving as you go about it. And one of the key things here is really just getting to know one another on a human level. Uh, key, people can be more direct, they can be more open, they can be more fearless if they see the human value in one another. When we can respect where each one of us is coming through and we can understand each other's past, it's creates a much healthier work environment for one another. Um, Chris Hadfield, who had that unwritten rule on the space station, one thing he did before all the astronauts went up into space is he made sure that all of the families got together beforehand. So all of the astronauts came together and they all brought their families in too. And they met and they talked and they shared stories and they got to know one another on that human level. So when they were up there, they weren't just astronauts doing a job, they knew each other on a personal level. And when we know one another on a personal level, often we'll have more respect, um, we'll be more compassionate as we work together, and we'll really search for a better level of understanding with one another. So it's really key to get to know one another on a human level. And part of this really comes from making time to talk to one another. Um, we have to be able to have that time if we want to get to know one another on a personal level. Um, Alex Pentland, another researcher from MIT, he studied uh, communication patterns at a call center. And what he ended up finding was that people needed more time to talk together on the team. So he recommended that coffee breaks be rescheduled so that everyone in a team took a break at the same time. So on the face of it, it really doesn't sound very efficient for a call center to have everybody on a team take their break at the exact same time. It'd be much easier for the call center to be able to keep people, some people on the phones. But the organization actually did it, and this one change, this one opportunity to build social capital actually ended up yielding the company 15 million in productivity gains, and employee satisfaction increased up to 10% all just from having people take a coffee break at the same time. Um, the Swedes have a term for time together at work and they call it fika. And it's a moment when everyone gathers for coffee and cake and it really dispenses of the hierarchy and people just come together to talk about work and non-work topics. And the word fika really signifies more than just a coffee break because it fosters a sense of togetherness within the people. And when you think about this idea of togetherness, I like to equate it to family dinners. So who eats dinner around the table today? And people are so busy with work, chores, running kids to events that family dinners are really difficult these days. Research has shown, though, that over the years, families who eat together can have some huge advantages. Kids have lower rates of substance abuse, teen pregnancy and depression, um, higher grade point averages and self-esteem. Studies indicate that dinner conversations is a more potent vocabulary booster than reading and that stories told around a kitchen table help our children build um, resiliency skills, kids also tend to have lower rates of obesity and eating disorders. And they've been associated with happier marriages, improved children's health, and stronger family times. 
and really these aren't your long drawn out family dinners. This is just your typical it takes longer to make the dinner than it does to eat it variety. But when you think about it, it makes sense because family dinners really give people time to talk and get to know one another. So they talk about what's coming up, you talk about what people are interested in, talk about what you might be struggling with, maybe somebody's having trouble with friends at school or they're struggling with math. We talk about past events at family dinners, celebrations, we talk about how mom and dad met, and we talk about what we value and what's important to our family. So when we make time to talk to one another at work, the same things start to happen. Researchers studying firefighters found that firefighter firehouses where firefighters ate together reported more cooperative behavior and they were better at their jobs. So when we make time for one another, we tend to like our jobs more and we also tend to be better at them at the same time. So if we're going to make time to talk to one another, one of the other things about building social capital is that we have to invest in listening skills. Listening is our most powerful tool to build respect and trust. We need to learn to listen not just from our own frame of reference. So that's the kind of, you know, I'm listening because I want to know what's in it for me. I'm listening because I'm thinking about what I'm going to say next. I'm listening for what my own needs are. And we need to switch that to listening from the other person's point of view. And this is what we call empathetic listening. So that when we're talking with somebody and they're speaking to us, we're listening from that mindset of why is this important to them? Why do they need us to understand this? Um, that's really the point we want to get to when we're building social capital as a team and as an organization that we really invest in those listening skills. And that's where you're going to find that your culture really comes together and people become more committed to one another. And the final step that I'm going to talk about for building social capital is that we need to understand how we all fit together. Not just where we fit in, but where others fit in as well. Because when we understand how we're interdependent on one another, we value one another more. So we build stronger bonds and it encourages us to help one another and work well together. We can see the value that each person brings to the team. So taking time to highlight how each person fits in the group and how each person adds to the company really helps us create that strong level of mortar between our bricks. Because what we find is that when we can create that sense of safety within our organizations, conflict and honest feedback aren't things that we avoid. They're things that we participate in and they're things that help us grow and improve. It really helps us to share freely and talk openly and it allows us to engage in conflict because we trust one another and we're know, we all know that we're in it together. Most of the time we'd rather avoid conflict because we think it will hurt the relationships that we have, but the opposite is actually true. Honest conflict, so conflict with good intentions, makes our social connection stronger. If we avoid arguments, nothing happens, nothing changes. But when we open ourselves to debate, we increase our capacity to see different perspectives. When we trust one another, we are safe to take risks, to ask for help when we're stuck or confused, and this all increases productivity, efficiency, and innovation. And when we go and we talk about building social capitals, we have to understand that it's all the result of the little actions. Social capital is an accumulation of the small actions in our day-to-day -day lives. When we think about building a great culture, we really need to forget about the word culture. Culture is just the end result of many, many little decisions and actions. It's the attitudes, the behaviors, and the actions of people at the work on a day-to-day -day basis that makes the difference in our culture. So to create a great culture, we've got to work from the inside out. Every person contributes each day through their choices, and we need to ensure that they're making the choices necessary to one day create a good culture. An easier way of looking at it is to think of climate as your trees and the culture as our forest. If we want a big, strong forest, we can't ignore the health of those trees. So each day within our organizations, we really need to be asking ourselves, how will we think about one another? How will we behave around one another? And what will our actions look like when we work together? Those are the three key aspects that we need to constantly be thinking about every single day when we're building social capital and we're building that strong support network. So that's step two of really building a strong culture. And our final step that we're going to look at is finding our purpose within the organization. And we really need to um, 
people really need a beacon or a light to draw them together and to rally around. I like to think about purpose in regards to parenting. I mean, being a parent, I've got two girls myself, uh, being a parent is a frustrating, thankless job most of the time. you got sleepless nights with babies, tantrums with toddlers, door slamming with sullen teenagers, and even once they've left, it's the constant worry that never leaves you. It's always worrying about your kids. Yet many people don't just relish the job of being a parent, they make it even harder by adding in additional children. And the majority say it's the most fulfilling aspect of their lives, even when research shows us that people with children are often less happy and are considerably lighter in their wallets than those without kids. So why do people do it? And I think that we do it because it provides with a strong sense of purpose. It gives our lives meaning, so we put up with the stress, the late hours, the grumpy coworkers who are your spouses, and the tyrant bosses, which are our small dictator children. Because in the end, parents feel like they've made a difference in the world. They feel like they've left something of themselves behind in their children. It's the small moment of pride and joy that make it all seem worthwhile. It's that purpose that allows them to be pulling their hair at one moment and having their heart melt the next. So in our organizations, we want people to have this same level of commitment. We want them to put the same effort and energy and patience and care into their work as they do for their families. So to accomplish this, we need to show people how their hard work contributes to a clear purpose they can identify with. People need to see what makes it all worthwhile to them beyond just that paycheck at the end of the week. Definitely we need the money. Nobody is coming to work most of the time without having that paycheck, but if we want people to be fully committed and to go beyond, we need to give them a sense of pride and joy and like they've made a difference and let a bit of themselves behind. And if you can give people that sense of purpose, they'll really stick with you through thick and thin. Because what a purpose does in our organizations is it connects people. Um, when you have a strong purpose in your organization, it promotes selflessness and it breaks down barriers. So people share the wins and the losses, the celebrations and the successes along the way. And purpose also creates a moral compass within our organizations. So purpose creates a decision-making filter. It allows people to independently make decisions beneficial for all because they have a clear sense of the direction of the organization. So when they're having to make a decision, they can think, okay, will this be beneficial to our purpose? Will this move us closer to that purpose without having to go and ask somebody else at the same time? And finally, purpose is a powerful driver. So having an image of what we're working towards makes the struggles and frustrations worthwhile. It makes us feel like our lives have meaning because it allows us to see progress that we've been making. Um, there's a great quote from the author of The Little Prince and it says, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the people to gather the wood, divide the work and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and the endless sea. These are our hardcore sailors the ones that want to be out on the sea. And they're the ones that will do anything in order to do that. And the fact is, is we are built for struggle. Since the dawn of time, we've used adversity to push ourselves to go further and dream bigger. But we need to know that what we're working for, we need to know what that is as we go about each day. Um, at the dawn of humankind, it was just pure survival. If we didn't work hard together, we weren't going to be the odds. But if we did, we'd flourish. Um, even if you if you don't know, I'm just waiting here, I, I don't see my uh, screen changing, so I'm going to give it a second here to roll through. Hmm, first glitch of the thing. Uh, if you don't know what your why is, if your why isn't strong, people are going to have a hard time feeling motivated to give more each day. But when, and when they come up against hardship after hardship with no meaning, that's when they're going to end up tapping their resiliency reserves too much. So if they don't see a purpose, if they don't see a meaning, and they're constantly having to pick themselves up off the ground, that's when we start to see disengagement creeping in, and that's when we have workplaces that are just getting by each day, rather than the ones that are using that, that hardship to build themselves up because they know that they're doing that hard work for something that's bigger than what they're doing each day. Um, purpose is really the difference between what we do and why we do it. When creating clarity around purpose, I like to think of the metaphor that Bernadette Chihuahua uses when she talks about marketing, and that's the fortune cookie. The cookie being what we do, 
the tangible, and the fortune being the why, the intangible, the magic, the motivator. Most people don't like fortune cookies because of the cookie part. They like it because of the fortune, that little bit of magic in it. When you look at a company like Zappos, their cookies are shoes, but their fortune is their one-of-a-kind customer service. Um, Tony Shea said that one day he hopes nobody will remember that they started with selling shoes. When he started the company, he wasn't even really interested in shoes. What he wants to be known for is the best customer service. Their values and their culture align to that. One of their values, one of their main ones, is to deliver wow through customer service. And because this purpose is so clear throughout their organization, their call center employees are fully empowered to serve customers. They don't work from a script, and they're encouraged to use their imaginations to make the customers happy. And this purpose led to a customer service call that was nine hours and 37 minutes long. Nine hours and 37 minutes. It happened between a customer loyalty team member named Shayla Bus and a customer named Lisa. So Shaya did not get off the phone until Lisa was happy. They talked about life, they talked about movies, they talked about favorite foods, and it sounds crazy, but that's what Zappos is all about. And because everyone was clear on that, no one on the team felt disgruntled that this one team member was spending the whole shift with just one customer, meaning they had heavier workload. Instead, they made sure that she had food, that she had drinks, and that she had everything she needed while on that call. That's what a purpose does within our organizations. Um, a great exercise you can do, great brainstorming exercise you can do with yourself or with your team, your organizations, is to sit down and talk about what are your cookies and what's your fortune. So the cookie is the given, the cookie is what you do, the fortune is the magic, the purpose. What motivates you and your people to come in each day and want to give more to the company and their team? Uh, Apple wanted to help the little guy take on the big guy. Harley Davidson sells a lifestyle of freedom. Microsoft wanted to put a PC on every desk. 3M wants to show the world how science rocks. So what's the cookie? What's the fortune? And once you've figured this out, and once you find your purpose, try to wrap it up in stories that can be kept alive in the day-to-day -day life of the organization. Just like the 9-hour and 37-minute customer service call at Zappos, Nike has corporate storytellers. They keep the stories alive in the minds of the employees, keeping them invested and committed to the company's core beliefs. So they have a culture of innovation. They create products, services, and experience for today's athletes while solving problems for the next generation. That's their purpose. So when the Nike leaders tell the story of how Coach Bill Bowerman, after deciding that the team needed better running shoes, went into his workshop and literally poured rubber into the family waffle iron. They're not just talking about Nike's famous waffle sole and how it was born. They're talking about the spirit of innovation. And when new hires come in and they hear tales of Steve Prefontaine, um, now a, a now deceased runner who was also coached by Bowerman, how he battled to make running a professional sport and to get better performing equipment, which ended up inspiring Bowerman and Phil Knight to build the Nike empire. They hear stories of Nike's commitment to helping other athletes. So when we can take our purpose and we can put it into these tangible stories that we share and that we tell, that's when we really drive commitment within our organizations. That's what allows people to go out of their way and to not feel like every day is a struggle, but every day it's something that they can look forward to achieving more and giving more. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Simon Sinek is that working hard for something we don't care about is called stress but working hard for something we love is called passion. When people are committed to a purpose and the going gets tough, they don't need to be resilient. They are more than willing to give more because they're passionate about what they're doing. They don't see the stress each day when they're coming into work. So if we want organizations that really rock and that aren't dependent on making sure that people are constantly drawing from their resiliency skills, we need to look at these key th three key areas. We need to make sure that we're always starting with the individuals and ensure that they feel strong and confident and they feel awesome every day they come into work. We need to encourage people to build strong connections with one another to make sure that we have that brick wall that's solidly built because we've applied our mortar properly and we need to find a solid purpose that drives people forward. And if you can incorporate these three areas, you won't end up with just a resilient culture. 
you're going to end up with one that thrives and one that stands the test of time. And that's always what we're looking for. Um, I'd like to thank you for listening. I'm coming to the end of my presentation now, and I want to just make sure that um, I thank you and also the Greater Kitchener Waterloo Chamber of Commerce for having me. We're always about making connections at our company. We love making new friends. Um, be sure to touch base with us at any one of these following links at any time. And I guess I'm going to leave the floor open for questions, if there happens to be any. No, it doesn't look like there's any questions, Renee. Thank you very much. That was a great, uh, a great presentation. So this presentation, along with past webinars, will be uh, posted on the Chamber website. Um, if you have any questions moving forward, please don't hesitate to contact Renee or get in touch with us here at the Chamber, and we will certainly put you in touch with Renee at Visit. So, so uh, thank you again, and enjoy the rest of your day, everyone.